All right, so yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, super excited to be talking to everyone today. See some familiar faces and some new faces. So thank you everyone for, for joining. Uh, for those of you who don't know, we used to sit behind this wall. I think our old logo is literally still double-sided taped to the, the garage in there because I think they're too scared to take the paint off. So that's one way to sponsor a garage, like $0. Um, that will be there forever, probably. So yeah, it's great to be back. And today we're going to be talking a lot about growth specifically. Um, obviously, it's growth is the lifeblood of a startup, especially in the early, early days when you're trying to decide if you're even on to something at all. Uh, and so we're going to, we kind of split this up into a few chapters. First is like your very first users up to maybe 100 people, something like that then going from hundreds-ish to thousands-ish, and then going from thousands-ish to 10,000s-ish. So depending on which stage you all are, are in, hopefully all of those are helpful. Obviously, if you're already past the earliest stages, that's awesome. Uh, hopefully, we'll have something useful for you by the end. Uh, so yeah, thanks for the intro. We don't really need to go over anything. I'm Matt. This is John. And uh, as far as why you should listen to us, uh, just really quickly going over where we are today for Copilot. So this is over the last, what, four years now. It's kind of crazy. Uh, you can see that we've just lived through all of these different chapters uh, from when I founded the company in 2019 here at the Schwartz Center. And so while we aren't Google and we don't have billions and billions of users in revenue or whatever, we are living in the trenches doing this day over day. And so hopefully we have a lot of really uh, tactical advice rather than super high level stuff that you might hear from uh, you know, people who have founded $10 billion companies and aren't actually running this stuff anymore. So hopefully very applicable in the trenches type advice is what we're going for for a company that's doing this right now. So first, just kind of talking about where we're focused in this giant question of growth. Normally to grow, you need to have some level of product market fit. I'm sure you've all heard of that term. And normally there's two components to this. One is the actual solution or product itself that is differentiated and actually solves a painful problem. And then the second is this right side, which is you actually need to be able to get that solution in front of people uh, and convince them that you're going to solve their problem and get them to, to, to give you their credit card ultimately. Uh, and so obviously we're focusing on the right side here today. We're kind of making this assumption that the thing that you're building has at least the beginnings of that left side, uh, because if you don't have the beginnings of that left side, a lot of the stuff we're going to talk about today is probably not a great time to, or not a great area to spend your time. Uh, normally you want to be, you know, splitting between these, but a bit of a bias towards the left in the early days. And one other term just to throw out there in terms of you're saying, oh, I wonder if, you know, we're good enough or I wonder if our product's good enough. You know, this looks different for every single company and we can share our version of this, but this is Mark Andreessen, famous investor at A16Z, uh, his definition of product market fit. And so if you're not experiencing something like this, again, you may want to reflect on the left side of the equation rather than obsessing over the right. Uh, so I'll hand it off to John to talk about the very first chapter. All right, thank you. Yes, so I'm gonna go over those very initial users that you want to get at your company. It's probably, one of the hardest things for a lot of startups is just getting those first handful of customers. Um, so that's what we're going to be talking about. But it's also can be the most rewarding and most fun part of growth is those very first customers. Some of you may be familiar with the Accelerator Y Combinator, and they have this very famous slogan of do things that don't scale. And that is definitely a motto that has worked for me in growing multiple startups getting those very first customers. So what does that mean? Do things that don't scale. That means be very manual in terms of doing direct sales, trying to acquire customers by any means possible, even if that way that you're acquiring a customer isn't something that could potentially scale up and get thousands of customers. One customer is way more than zero. So whatever you have to do to get that first customer or that first 10 customers is probably worth it if you have no customers at all. So that means things like using your networks, having your friends and family buy your product or service 
is a valid way to get customers, especially the first few. The first uh, customer I ever got for Copilot was my sister. Um, so it'll likely be very manual and it will probably take you longer than you expect. A lot of people kind of put off growth. They focus on all of these other kind of high level business questions. Um, but I think it's very important to, to focus a lot of energy early on, on acquiring your very first, cust very first customers so you can get feedback as quickly as possible. And it'll probably take you longer than you expect. So talk to your customers, get feedback, and use your networks. Be very manual, because that will allow you to have conversations with real people, real customers, so that you can learn more and iterate faster. So doing things that don't scale, like some examples that are very real to Copilot, some just random things that we did in the early days to try and get our very first customers. So setting up a table on a street corner, we literally took a folding table, put it out on a street and just talked to people about Copilot. Uh, like I said, force your friends and family to buy it just so you can get some users, some revenue, some feedback on your product. Even if they're not your ideal customer, just getting someone in the door to get some initial traction is valuable. Uh, we gave away free Apple Watches. So this is definitely not scalable. We can't give away hundreds of dollars of Apple Watches, but it enabled us to get our initial customers. Uh, we scraped <laughs> alumni databases and sent them handwritten letters. Um, we called a bunch of local gyms and pitched them on remote training. Uh, we went in person to pitch them. So we just showed up at the gym and, and said, hey, we have this product. Do you want to try it? Uh, we DM'd thousands of people on LinkedIn and Reddit and other social media platforms. Um, but... There's a few other examples. Basically, all of these were, were very manual and took a lot of our time, which is very valuable in uh, the early days of a startup. But getting your first customers and getting feedback from them is also extremely valuable. So it's worth your time. And again, talk to your user, users often. Uh, the first few sales uh, should be as much face time or one-on-one -on -one conversation based as possible so you can get that feedback and understand what problems they actually have so you can be creating a product that actually solves their problem. Um, and one way to do that is just asking them how they're already solving that problem today and kind of base your, your assumptions off of that. Uh, another big recommendation I have is reading the very, very short book, The Mom Test, will, which will help you kind of guide those initial conversations with users. So definitely recommend that book. It's super short. And I think there's free PDF versions available online. All right. So let's say you've done things that don't scale. You've gotten your first few customers. You have a product that has some level of product market fit uh, or solves a painful problem for people. And you want to start getting more customers. Um, you'll need some sort of actual growth channel to get a significant number of customers beyond those first few. Uh, and so what I'll be going through now is a framework that I've used based on several other founders uh, frameworks that has been successful for me. It's not the only way to get customers, but if you don't know what you're doing in terms of getting your first users, this framework is extremely useful, very practical, and has worked for me almost every single time. So um, what is a growth channel? A channel is what connects your product with potential customers. At the highest level, a channel is a place where you can get impressions, so just views of your product or service, and then attempt to convince people to purchase that product or service. So how do you find these growth channels? What I'm going to be discussing is basically the bullseye framework, framework which is outlined by Gabriel Weinberg in his book, Traction. And in that book, he outlines a framework that posits that there's 19 types of growth channels that you can use to acquire customers. So this framework is all about going through each of those 19 channels and testing them individually to find which one works for you and your business and your product and service. All right, so these are the full 19 channels that he lists out in this framework. There's a lot of different ones. I'm not gonna go through them all individually, but they cover pretty much any way you could possibly think about trying to get customers reliably. 
A lot of them are pretty broad. So there's a lot of sub channels within each of these, but they cover pretty much any way you could imagine a business to, or consumer business to acquire, or even uh, a B2B business to acquire customers. So the framework is all about going through each of these channels and coming up with ideas for each one to test out that channel to see if it'll work for your business. Oh, I don't know if this is working. I can use this. So there are 19 channels. Um, and a lot of you, if you already have a business that you're working on, you might have dismissed a lot of those channels as like, oh, that won't work for me because that's not what people in my industry use, but don't do that. All of those channels could be potentially viable for you and your business. And some of them, especially the underutilized ones, could be extremely valuable for your business. So maybe you're a mobile gaming app and most mobile gaming apps won't be sending uh, postcards to houses as a way of marketing, but that could potentially be a very valuable way to acquire customers for you and your business, depending on how you approach that. Um, so anything is open. Do not put anything off limits before you kind of get your ideas down and start testing stuff. Okay, so how do you actually evaluate a channel or create tests to evaluate a channel? There are three questions you want to ask yourself when evaluating a channel to see if it's going to work for you and your business. So the first one is, what is the cost, both in time and money, to acquire a customer from that specific channel? Uh, two, how many potential customers are available in that channel? So is it possible to scale within that channel? And then are these the type of customers you actually want? So those are the three guiding questions you want to be continually asking yourself as you're thinking of ideas for how to test those 19 channels, as well as evaluating if those tests are worth uh, going forward and if they're worth uh, pursuing further. Okay, so let's break them down a little bit more. So that first question, what is the cost to acquire a customer? Again, how much time and how much money do you have to put into that channel to get one customer out? That's the cost to acquire the customer. Uh, and that is a very important number to know in terms of scaling. Um, again, early on, getting your first few customers, you don't want to worry too much about that. I mean, you don't want to be spending thousands and thousands of dollars, but presumably as a young company, you don't have that to spend anyways. So don't worry too much about your time and effort early on, but you do want to think about that in terms of scaling a channel. Up. That is going to be very important. Second question, how many customers are available? This is very useful for planning future tests and comparing against other, channel, other channels. So you might be able to get a decent number of customers within a given channel, Facebook ads, Google ads, something like that. But at, at a, a good cost to acquire that customer that you might like, but there might not be a lot of customers available within that channel. So this is very useful for comparing different channels against one another. Okay, third question, are these the type of customers you want? Does this channel have people who really need your product or service? Are you solving a real pain point for them. Do these people refer your product? So maybe you are solving a problem for them, but maybe they're not talking about it. And maybe there's a group of people that would be talking about your product more using a different channel. And then would these people be very disappointed if they had to stop using your product or service? So this is a really good metric to tell how, how sticky is your product, how valuable is your service to those people? And so those are the types of questions you want to ask yourself to determine, is this channel full of customers that I really want? Okay, so how do you actually implement this on a day-to-day -day basis? So my first step is just make a huge spreadsheet of all my ideas for how I'm going to test each of those 19 channels for a given business. So I literally make a giant Excel with 19 different tabs. Each tab is one of those channels. And then I go through and just list out every single possible idea I can think of, no matter how crazy it is, no matter how expensive, no matter how silly, no matter how uh, boring it is, I put it on that list. Just brainstorm as many test ideas as you can for each channel. 
And then before you actually go out and test, you want to kind of do a pre-analysis of each of those ideas and using those three questions we talked about earlier. So how much is it going to cost to acquire a customer in this channel? How scalable is the channel or how many customers could I get from this channel? And then are these the type of customers I want? So you don't necessarily have that data yet, but you want to try and kind of uh, envision what those answers might be like so that you can rate rank your tests in terms of um, which ones you want to go for first. So after kind of using those pre-analysis three questions, you also want to rank all of your tests just by which ones have the big, biggest potential upside, but also the are the easiest to do. So those are the ones you're really going to want to target to do first. Um, if it's going to be very easy to go walk up to people in this classroom or in a connect place to ask them about your business and service, that might be the, the best place to start. So easiest with the biggest potential upside, those are the tests you're going to want to target first in all of these channels. And then just test, test, test. So you want to start going through your ideas and testing each one of them um, and evaluating the results based on those three questions. So what did it cost you to acquire a customer? Did you acquire any customers? Um, how many customers are available in that channel? And then are those the type of customers you want? Uh, when do you know if you've thoroughly tested a channel? This isn't something that is uh, perfectly defined and it'll be case by case for every test and every channel that you evaluate. But some rough guiding kind of bullet points are that a single test probably shouldn't take longer than one month to do. And it probably shouldn't cost more than $1,000. There's a lot of cases where that might not be true, depending on the size of your business and exactly what your business involves. But those are some rough uh, rules that are, are pretty true in most businesses that I've seen. And then sometimes a channel may require multiple tests. So maybe you want to run Facebook ads and you put out one ad and it doesn't get any customers. That doesn't necessarily mean Facebook isn't going to work for you. It might require multiple tests. But having said that, don't feel too attached to any single channel. So don't keep testing one channel incessantly um, just to because you think it might work. If something's not working, that's why you have a huge spreadsheet of ideas. Just try something else and maybe come back to that later. And at Copilot, we tested over 55 different channels before we found one that really works. So it can definitely take some time to find something that actually works. Hopefully you'll be acquiring customers along the way and you'll find something that works to some degree. But even for us, it took a lot of time and a lot of testing to find something that really worked. All right, and now I'll hand it back to Matt to talk about scaling those channels up. Um, all right, so yeah, this is sort of our last chapter where we now have some channels identified and we're maybe still experimenting a bit on finding some new better versions of those channels but a lot of this sort of now changes into this game of optimizing and really squeezing every dollar you can out of the channels that you have um so one thing to remember is that most companies get the vast majority of their scale from one channel um, some companies, maybe two channels, but there's definitely this like myth where, you know, you look at a company and you see that they're doing a bunch of different acquisition marketing activity. And you're like, man, they're, they, they have every channel working. They're doing TV and they're doing app store and they're doing Google and they're doing Facebook. The harsh reality of this is that almost every large business, we're talking, you know, hundreds of millions of revenue business that we've talked to the executives at. They are doing all of those things, but historically, all of their growth, especially all of their profitable growth, almost always can be traced back to just one or two. Uh, and sort of doing all of them is normally an effort to just be more diverse, to experiment, to find things. When you have huge amounts of money, you can afford to do those kinds of things. But if you have a channel that's working, and this is a mistake we've made, don't bang your head on a wall trying to find a second channel that works when you have a really obvious channel in front of you that you can use to scale. Um, and then, like, as we'll talk about, we're going to be taking that channel and we're going to be optimizing it and scaling it up to make it more efficient. Um, and 
last thing I'll in sort of high level is that while yes, it's true that almost everything comes from one channel, uh, you always want to have some small percentage of your budget, maybe 10% to throw a number out there that you're constantly using to continue to do the kind of stuff that John just described, even when you're at that, you know, millions of dollars of ARR scale. Like you always, you never want to leave that opportunity on the table of, oh, maybe there's, maybe the 56th channel test is actually 10 times better than the 55th, right? You always want to have some sort of process running that's testing additional channels. Uh, so just talking a little bit about what is this thing, this thing that we're going to be optimizing. The word that people like to use is like the funnel. Uh, and that means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. But this is just an example of sort of what a, a generic, you know, acquisition funnel looks like. So the channel itself will be funneling impressions into the top of your funnel, uh, which is, you know, could be a website landing page, could be the first screen of an app that someone downloads. Uh, and then normally people call it the click-through rate is what percentage of people go from a given page, like that first one, for example, to the next one. Um, so an example for us would be top of the funnel is maybe someone watching a YouTube video that has a mention of Copilot in it. And then the click-through rate would be the percentage of people who click the link in that description and go to our landing page to actually see what Copilot is about. And you can see rough orders of magnitude on the top here for what companies normally experience, which is another important thing to keep in mind as you're testing channels. Like if you run Facebook ads for 50 bucks and you get a thousand people to look at your ad or whatever, um, then you would only expect, I don't know, one person maybe or 10 people at most to get to your landing page. And so you don't want to conclude that that test was unsuccessful, for example, just because you only got one click or no clicks. So just understand that there's like orders of magnitude drop off between these steps normally. And that's important to keep in mind. Landing page goes to some sort of, you're creating an account that goes to some sort of actually purchasing of the product or starting a free trial. And then last one is one that sometimes people don't actually include in a funnel, but is, is really part of it, is what percentage of your customers are actually going to be retained or actually going to keep paying you over time, especially obviously if it's a subscription business, but this could also be like the repeat purchase rate if you're selling like a more traditional you know, e-commerce good. Um, so you can see that that one is hopefully not quite an order of magnitude drop off, but you know, close to it. <laughs> and so, and you can see on the bottom here, there's all these mechanisms that we can use. If someone doesn't make it from one step to the next, if someone goes to our landing page, but not to our account creation, we can use retargeting campaigns, which we'll talk a bit about. Or if someone purchases the product, but then isn't retained to the product, we can use reactivation campaigns to try to get them to come back and, and reactivate their subscription. Oh, yeah, sure. Let's do it. Um, yeah, great question. So, uh, yes, it was obvious. And, you know, sort of as... Mr. Andreessen said in that quote at the beginning, when you find these pieces that actually click together and work, you will not have to ask yourself if it works. And so like the specific story for Copilot is John was hired. He made his giant spreadsheet. He was chugging along. He was testing all kinds of crazy stuff. Some are embarrassing to say out loud. Um, and one day he says, oh, well, let's try sponsoring one of these random YouTubers that I watched, uh, that, he, that he watched. And we sponsored the YouTuber. And the first video he made was kind of about us, but kind of just a generic video where he mentioned us. And at the time, I think we had, I don't know, 50 customers, 50 paying customers paying us $100 a month or so. And that video, when it went out, got us on the order of another 50 customers. And so immediately, this one activity doubled our our revenue and so we thought that was exciting oh there's potential here like let's double click here let's keep trying and we actually tried several other variations of youtube videos none of which worked <laughs> and so we were right on the precipice of saying oh man like i guess that was just a one-hit wonder like this isn't really the channel like on to number 57 um sort of i don't want to say behind our back but like John went off and scheduled a second video with the original guy thinking, okay, there's something there. Like, I want to see what happens. Here's going to be my next test is make a whole video just about us. 
will pay you ten thousand dollars which is actually very affordable we know now but at the time it was a terrifying amount of money like i think we had less than 100k in the bank account at that point and john's over here dropping it on one youtube video and that youtube video went out on like december 18th of 2020 and within a day we had gotten another 100 customers within a week we had gotten another 500 customers within a month we had gotten another 1000 customers and suddenly from this one $10,000 video we had gone from 50 customers $5,000 a month to over a million dollars a year in revenue run rate from just that one event and so immediately when that happened obviously the mindset shifted from oh my god does anyone want this like you know oh we what's the next channel we're going to test like uh you know maybe we should pivot the product to instantly oh shit we need to hire more trainers like how are we going to do this like we need more welcome boxes we should go raise venture money because we're not going to be able to pay all the trainers who are going to train the clients and like everything was blowing up right totally different problem set than what it was just 24 hours before that video came out so that and then that formed the foundation of what our growth channel is today we're now in January, for example, we did a video equivalent to that one every single day during the month of January. We spent over almost $500,000 on those videos in one month. And we do that almost every single month now. Uh, so videos coming out almost every single day, following a very similar formula to what was discovered back there, acquiring you know now 100 customers plus a day uh, from that system. Any other questions or so yeah you'll know uh just a quick sort of connecting these two pieces together so these are all the channels that john was you know talking about and all of these are potentially puzzle pieces that you can plug into the beginning here um so yeah just to connect those two ideas in your head of doesn't really matter ultimately where the impressions or what the channel is ultimately oops sorry ultimately they do have to go into some kind of funnel that then has to be optimized and all all of these pieces need to sort of line up and be as efficient as possible so that's what we're going to talk about and we're going to kind of double click on a few of the most common types of channels i don't have time to i don't have the time or the expertise to do all 19 <laughs> and so we're just going to talk about the ones that we know best um so advertising specifically like digital advertising you know facebook ads instagram ads TikTok ads like that kind of stuff right um generally has three components the copy which is the text the creative which is the image or video and then the audience that you're actually targeting with that advertising and so i imagine this is like a three-dimensional matrix if you will or just a three-dimensional space where one of those parameters is each axis and then it's your job to sort of test along all three of those dimensions to find the most optimal points in that space. And so this is probably obvious, but it's really important to align copy, creative, and audience. You don't want to just randomly pick spots in that 3D space that are kind of arbitrary. You want to try to like narrow that 3D space down to find the pockets that make the most sense. Um, so, you know, if you're using a picture of a businessman carrying a briefcase, the, the copy of struggling to fit a workout into your busy day, and then you target like high earners based on income zip code, right? That would be an example of like, it makes sense. Like, does that ad actually work? I have no idea, right? Like we probably have tested that, but I have no idea. Um, but that's what I mean by like choosing ones that at least make sense in that space rather than just saying, yeah, here's a hundred copies, here's a hundred pictures, and here's a hundred audiences. Let's see what happens. Like that can get really, really expensive and inefficient, especially if you're an early stage company. In general, uh, videos are better than stills uh, in terms of clicks and engagement. Um, but again, in general, you need fairly high quality videos to really reap those benefits. And so we've gotten pretty far with stills. And then, you know, we'll talk a bit about where you can get some of that video content from. You can use things like influencer videos and repurpose them as video content. You can use nowadays AI generated video content. Thanks, OpenAI's brand new model, whenever it comes out uh, to help solve that problem. Uh, but yeah, obviously you want high quality, engaging content 
uh, not just whatever is the easiest and cheapest to make because unsurprisingly, people are a lot less likely to click on those. Um, you want to use what's called lookalike audiences. And essentially this is um, using built-in functionality of all of these advertising platforms to take actual feedback from who is touching your site and feeding it back into the advertising system. So for example, if I see a co-pilot ad on Facebook, I click on it, I go to the landing page, there's a, a pixel, which is what they call it, on the actual site that logs that my user has gone there. And now Facebook knows, all right, so Matt is the kind of person who clicked on this ad. So now I'm going to automatically change who I'm showing this ad to, to try to find more people like Matt. And you could imagine that gets fairly effective at scale when you have thousands and thousands of people going to the site, Facebook can then build this really good understanding of who you're trying to target. Um, is it, it isn't magic. It doesn't get you millions of free customers, right? It still can be expensive and requires budget, um, but it definitely helps improve um, overall performance. And then lastly, um, is or the last thing that I wish I knew when we started testing stuff was use ads with a very clear measurable objective rather than just running ads for impressions or even running ads for clicks is not great. Um, there's a lot of I don't know, sketchy for lack of better word stuff that happens on Facebook, where if you run an ad for clicks, you'll see a thousand people click it. And then you'll look on your website and you'll be like, a thousand people did not click that ad. Like I only saw 12, right? And you're like, what is going on here? So I don't know if that's Facebook or if that's bots or whatever, but almost every time when we've run an ad for clicks, we see something like that. What we ultimately end up doing is you run an ad for an actual objective that you control. So that's like a customer putting in their email and pressing subscribe, a customer putting in their credit card and pressing pay. And you can set these up so that Facebook only counts those as success. So then their models can tune themselves to those events rather than the events that Facebook controls like a click. Mm -hmm. um, so again, just moving the ball into your court a little bit more um, because yeah, Facebook, Again, Facebook or people bots on Facebook will literally scam you out of your ad dollars uh, if you don't keep an eye on that. Yes. Uh, in the initial test of the YouTube video, what was it about that specific YouTuber that worked to differentiate it? Yeah, if I had to summarize it, I would say that YouTuber genuinely loved the product. And their audience in general was a group of people who satisfied all those criteria John was talking about for, um, you know, the kind of people you want from a channel. Uh, and like, we didn't realize at the time how lucky we were for all of those things to be the case, but that's kind of the point of this, right? Like you do ultimately have to play the statistics odds game, right? Like if it was the first channel we tried, I would have been like, yeah, we're pretty fucking lucky. But <laughs> since it was the 55th, you can also make the argument for, well, yeah, after you try 55 things, statistically, like, you know, you're if you roll the dice enough times, you'll eventually roll the exact roll that you want, which is the alignment of these things, right? Um, so it's def it definitely felt, in hindsight, it feels like a make your own luck kind of scenario of John rolled the dice enough times that eventually he found a YouTuber who happened to love the product just organically would give us a good rate on the video and had a good audience and was very, you know, uh, charismatic and good at pitching the product as well. And all of those things aligned together to make still to this day, uh, one of the most effective videos that we have ever done. Like, I don't know what the cost to acquire a customer on that video is like 10 bucks or something or yeah. like $5. Like that is ridiculous, you know, to get, a customer who for us at least is worth two thousand dollars over their lifetime for five dollars is insane right and so like that's the kind of like mind-breaking math you're looking for when you're looking for these initial signals i wish we could hit that every time but definitely don't get anywhere close to that um uh so influencers since obviously we're talking about influencers for us this is our main thing um, so just some quick tips for if you're going to test and try influencers. Um, so number one is clearly define what you want the influencer to do or what you need them to do rather. 
Um, a lot of brands will underdefine this and then be frustrated <laughs> with the results that they get. Uh, we very we are very very strict uh, with what we require influencers to do. I'd say the most important thing is not necessarily exactly what the influencer says, but rather getting the influencer to actually use and internalize the value of the product. So for us, what that looks like is we actually write it into the contract that the influencer has to work out. <laughs> like they have to work out, what is it, three or what is 10? It's changed a million times, like eight total workouts or something over a certain period of time. And what you'll find is the influencers that perform well are the ones who do not eight workouts, but 20 workouts and they're just like, Hey, can I keep using this? Even though the sponsorship is over Like, that's what you want, right? Like if you actually have a good product, some percentage of people you pay to use it, you know, should stick around and enjoy it. Um, so yeah, getting them to internalize value, uh, experience with different sizes and niches. Um, the smaller ones can be a huge pain to work with and the huge ones can be a huge pain to work with in a different way. Um, so depending on your product, depending on your budget, depending on everything, you can try all the way down to the, you know, up and coming 10,000 followers influencer who would do something for a bowl of Chipotle up to the 10 million subscriber influencer who won't even take your meeting until you give them six figures, right? So there's a huge, um, and then above that, even like celebrity movie star people, right? Or won't talk to you unless if you give them a million dollars. Um, or Mr. Beast. Uh, so <laughs> we did talk to Mr. Beast, by the way, what was it? Two million for two and a half million for, uh, 30 seconds, something like that. Yeah. In case of you are wondering, uh, don't do that one first. Uh, that, that would be a bad, that would be a bad use of seed money. I can say that confidently. Um, unless if you, uh, you know, raise from SoftBank or something, um, then you can do it. Um, Expect about 50% of all kinds of influencers. And this could probably be even extended to like all kinds of B2B-esque channels where you're like making a partnership relationship with someone and then hoping that will acquire your users. They're just so hard to get right. Everything has to align. Even if both people are super excited on day one and you all agree on the best terms ever, it's just really hard to have these be home runs every single time. So don't get discouraged. If you know a few swings of the bat just fall completely flat, even today it's around this number are just infathomably inefficient. But then on the other end of the spectrum, you have some that just blow away expectations, like the video I described. And so if you average enough of those videos together, you end up with a pretty efficient channel overall. But you know, I've never met a brand that's like, yeah, every single video is about the same and they're all at this level. It's like you know, the actual graph looks like this, but then when you average it, you actually get something pretty smooth. And yeah, you can reuse influencer content, as I mentioned earlier, on social media, and that can be pretty effective. Especially one like very in the weeds hack we found is um, running the ad, running an ad using that influencer's content on that influencer's social page as an ad. What I mean by that is you could run it on your page as a brand, as an ad, but then it feels like an ad. But if you run an ad essentially for their video on their page, you're just driving more like organic, high intent traffic to that video um, without it feeling like an ad. So we've actually seen way better returns on doing that than just running a, a snippet of a video as an ad under our brand. Yeah, what's up? So any ads for the new Yep. Yeah, so it again totally depends on your brand and your product. For us, our ideal customer is not someone who's walking around with a six pack who wants to get more shredded, bigger, whatever. They're ultimately people who are relatively new to fitness, especially new to strength training and are looking for, you know, really um, sort of approachable coaching to get them through those first steps. And a great way to like tell that story is find people who aren't traditionally six pack bulky influencer people and have them actually experience that. Right. And so like Wheezy Waiter, who was the, you probably haven't heard of, but was the first channel, the one that blew up originally like he just, he likes trying stuff. He likes doing self-improvement projects, but like 
he's just a dad with a dad bod, you know, like he's nothing special in the fitness world still isn't today, but he's a lot stronger and like more able bodied and he can go and play with his kids on the floor and stuff. And like, that's the story he tells. And so Johnny Harris, I don't know as well as Wheezy Waiter, but you know, similar of not a fitness influencer still is a human being who was interested in improving their health. And I believe was it Johnny Harris or another one who actually had a really crazy like progress. I'm oh, sorry. Another one that was just like Johnny Harris. What was that one? <laughs> Philip DeFranco, if you know him. So, um, yeah. Uh, what's up? So does that impact like the conversion to it? Some people want to do it, but they do not. Yep. Yeah, really good question. So a hard lesson for us to learn as a company and brand has been that it's actually a pretty bad business if we just exclusively go after people who have never left their couch. Um, because as, as you're pointing out, those people have it, even if you give them everything they could possibly need, you show up at their doorstep, you pull them off the couch and you say, all right, let's go work out together. The second you look away for one second, a lot of those people will sit back down on the couch, right? And while it would be awesome from like a mission-driven perspective to say, that's the only customer we go after, we just get people off the couch, whatever, that's awesome. The reality is, is that our product at least is a lot more effective, like one step past that, where someone has mostly gotten themselves off the couch and they're doing some basic stuff and they're going on walks and they maybe went to a class or two and they're just like, okay, like, what do I do now? Like, what's a, what, how do I go into the weight section of the gym? That's like scary and crazy. Or like, you know, how do I actually like get better at this over time? I'm just doing random stuff, right? That person we found is actually ideal. So we didn't know that on day zero and we fine tuned that understanding by just talking to people over and over again of, you know, talk to the people who made it six months in versus the people who didn't um, at day zero. And you can go and then compare how they actually do. And that will teach you a lot about, okay, does my product actually do what I want it to do or what I thought it did? Or is it a little bit more uh, nuanced than that? Yep. But the problem with that is by the time January hits and then Feb hits, it's like everyone forgot their resolution. Yep. So do you see like a huge drop off rate over there? And then also like you know, how does how do you work with that? Because you have a huge hit and then you plan based on hit, mm -hmm. but then again you have a huge drop. Yep. Yeah. So again, this is one place totally depends on the product. For us. We actually see the opposite of what I believe most gym chains see, where to this date, that first cohort is our best retained cohort of all time. Like, and it's tantalizing that we were never able to <laughs> beat that one because it's just always there at the very top. Um, but we found that, yes, there's definitely a volume effect of if you do stuff seasonally for a business, for us, that's New Year's time. You just get more bang for your buck. You get more signups. But interestingly, what we found is that that does not actually correspond to lower retention. In fact, the January cohorts every year are the best ones. It's normally the summer cohorts or the back to school cohorts that are actually the worst in terms of retention. In terms of was that a requirement for us to have solved the like found that growth channel? No, I don't think so. Like we've had videos that have been similar levels of home run totally outside the context of the New Year's, but it definitely amplified the signal at the time. So, but even if we had gotten, I don't know, 50%, even 30, 20% of the output from that video, I think we still would have been running around, like freaking out being like, oh my God, so many customers, like we found something, right? Um, so I don't think it like, it, was, it wasn't necessary. Yeah, it just helped. Yep, yeah, go ahead. Yes. So we have tried a lot. Ultimately, what we do now is a combination of we manage a lot of it in-house. And in the early days, and we'll talk about this in the last section, is 
outsourcing stuff, especially growth, is really dangerous um, to early stage companies. And so you never want to like fully give away that, yeah, go find us some influencers that you think will work and like report back to us. That will never work. Like, I mean, maybe someone has seen that work, but I've never seen that work. So like it had to be John in the early days because he's the only one who actually had enough skin in the game to really make it work. Nowadays, we've been able to take the learnings from people like John and apply them to our own internal employees, as well as several agencies that we work with to help source and manage the influencers. Because of the size of influencer we use, we don't use a lot of the search a million influencers and find you know the hundred that work for you. If you're going for the smaller ones, I think those tools can be fine. But for us, we generally go for like the mid-sized ones, and so we don't use those tools. I think. Yeah, just to continue yeah, on that, I would say definitely early on, like the tools can be useful, but you don't need a tool to start reaching out to influencers. You can find their contact information online. You can DM them and you'll, you won't get a crazy high response rate, but you will get people that respond to you eventually. So yeah. just keep trying to reach out to them. So if cost is an issue, you don't need a tool, but if you have lots of money and you want to get a tool, it can be useful, but it's not like going to unlock a, a huge amount of success right away for you. Yeah. Not having a tool will also, in having a lower response rate, will increase the likelihood that the influencers you do partner with actually care about your product though. Um, so that's an, it. Like John was able to sign what is now considered the craziest, most best deal we've ever signed with no tools, no experience, nothing, because he was just like, Hey, I really like your videos and we have this cool fitness thing. And like, he happened to like be interested in trying a fitness journey at the moment and liked John's story, right? Like that was it. And that was enough to sign that deal. So, um, yeah, definitely don't over index on, on those. Only we'll spend a second on this. Can definitely double click if you guys are more interested, but uh, double click, no pun intended. Um, but there's a lot of different ways to measure all the different steps of this performance stuff. CAC and lifetime value are probably two of the ones you guys have heard a lot already, but there's similar metrics that you can use for every single step of uh, this thing. Every one of these arrows has its own three letter acronym in marketing. Uh, and you'll learn all of those over time. And essentially, you just want to pick the right three-letter acronym for the step that you're trying to optimize and just make sure you can measure it really accurately uh, and, and uh, get it over time. One like very tactical suggestion at the bottom here. Um, if you have any idea what your CAC or what your LTV is, you should use something like this rule where, okay, so let's say you don't know your CAC. So I'd recommend 10 times your monthly price is a good line in the sand that you can draw for how much you should be willing to spend on a test to see any kind of result, right? So if you have a $10 a month product, you should spend at least $100 um, before you're willing to say, okay, maybe this channel isn't working at all, right? Um, for us, we have a $100 a month product, so we would spend, like John said, $1,000 on a channel to test it. Um, if you know roughly how much one channel costs to get a customer, I would use a number of like three times that or five times that as a line in the sand as well. And that can just be helpful to know because especially with these digital advertising ones, I remember in the early days, we would just run, you know, a hundred bucks of ads and those ads wouldn't get anyone. And then we would be like, oh, well, I guess ads don't work. And we didn't really understand what our expectations should be around how much spend should equate to some kind of result. Uh, in terms of actually running these, I'll go over this super quickly since I know we're coming up on time. Um, this is kind of what we do uh, at Copilot. And this started out basically all just being in John's head. <laughs> and over time, we've built teams and teams of people around doing this really well. Um, so yeah, essentially, you design an experiment with a clear hypothesis. You build the experiment. You test the experiment. You launch it. You start measuring. And then you wait for, depending on the type of test, I would say you know, a month is probably a safe amount to wait, but that's a really expensive amount of time for an early stage company. So if you're really just trying to like make quick, sometimes wrong decisions, you can do a week, two weeks, three weeks. Um, and then you analyze the results and you do it again. And what you can do is you can like stagger these. So like every week, for example, we'll start four or five different tests. 
And then every week, we also have four or five tests from a week ago or a month ago ending. And so we constantly have this sort of cycle of tests being started and tests ending. So every single day, basically, we're learning something. We're either determining that a test was a success or a failure. We're adopting it. We're either throwing it or throwing it out. And then we're starting another test. So if if you keep this, this machine going, uh, you can pretty quickly center in on at least much better performance and eventually pretty optimal performance for a given channel. Hiring is the last big thing we wanted to talk about um, because it's definitely the most common mistake in growth overall. Um, so no one is going to magically solve growth for you except for John. Um, and so it's your job to figure it out, not the business Tepper intern. Uh, no offense, Tepper. Um, but like, it's going to be a co-founder or it's going to be the first hire. It's going to be someone full-time on your team who has a lot of skin in the game, who is like, I need to solve this or I'm not, or like, what am I doing? Right? Like it has to be their entire purpose to solve this problem. Agencies will never solve this early stage problem. Like I do not know a single agency that for a thousand dollars a channel will go and test 56 channels to find the one that works, right? If you know that agency, like, holy shit, send me their contact information um, because that would be pretty good. But almost always you'll never get that kind of speed, cost effectiveness, and just drive to make things work that you'll get for from like a founder or first employee. So always push yourself to do this yourself or bring on like a full-time person onto your team who is hacky and ready to make it happen. Um, yeah, generalists are always better than specialists at the early stage. Um, like we've talked to now a lot of specialist people who were at XYZ huge company with lots of consumer marketing. And you would think that they would just be able to jump in and like make shit happen and like solve some of these problems. What happens in practice is you take people out of these huge systems that have all of these things built already, they really, really struggle again to do the, okay, my job is now running 56 tests for a thousand dollars each with, you know, running one test every few days. Like that kind of person is very different from the kind of person that runs marketing at that series C startup that you really look in, look up to. Right. So, you know, find yourself a John, essentially a previous founder, hacky dude who, was working at Chipotle at the time when I found him, uh, who was willing to jump on and take a huge risk um, for, you know, overall a huge uh, reward. Um, and then, yeah, yeah, essentially until you reach 10,000 user scale, I would say, is when maybe that starts to shift. But even then, generalists are pretty strong, uh, unless if you have huge amounts of conviction around a certain channel and you're like, I just need the best person in the world for this channel that's when that can start to shift a little bit. So super high level, do things that don't scale, keep talking to your users. We still do a lot of things that don't scale and still talk to our users a ton today. Um, don't expect an agency or an intern or you know someone who's not fully integrated to solve your growth problem or any problem, really. Don't do this for engineering either, another common mistake. Use the bullseye framework that John described to actually find which of those 19 channels is promising for you. And then once you find anything that looks promising, immediately switch into, I am a optimizing scientist mode and run these experiments day over day, week over week to try to make that channel as effective as possible. If you're interested in taking this further, um, we can definitely send out these slides so you have these links, but these are uh, some of the resources that John referenced in his section, as well as the mom test book. And then you can connect with us uh, on LinkedIn is probably the best way to get in touch with us. You can also email us. We're just Matt and John at uh, mycopilot.com. And yeah, I think that's pretty much all we have. So we can answer questions in the time that is left. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so for us, trainers are actually full-time employees. Uh, we are not like a two-sided marketplace. And so, yes, acquiring a trainer looks very different. It, it looks much more like a traditional hiring pipeline where we put up job postings with good salary and good benefits. 
and we get a lot of organic interest in those positions. And then it's up to us to funnel those down and ultimately hire, you know, the best people for the job. Yep. Can you just talk about what your product like not early, like zero to hundred Yes. Yeah, so it was it was pretty rough. Uh, <laughs> it was not. It was the probably pretty close to the roughest version of the product that actually delivered the core value. And so specifically, what it looked like for us was we had like one trainer at when, when that video went out. We had like just hired our second trainer part time because we weren't sure if we would need a full time one. We did. Um, and they, when we had a really basic app that would like show you the exercise you were doing and that was basically it. And it would let you chat with the trainer. Um, and the app would crash about every 20 seconds you were using it. Um, it was really, really bad. Uh, that, that was my fault. Um, and so like the users, the question is, is that shitty product good enough to deliver the core value to prove that there's something here or not? And it was because 90% of our value, especially in those early days, was coming from the trainer themselves. And so the fact that we had a really good trainer that you could call to onboard with, message with, get workouts from, get feedback from, that was like checking off all the most important boxes in the user's mind. And the, the fact that you texted the trainer over their personal SMS number and the fact that the workout app crashed every 20 seconds and the million other things that I'm sure I'm, I've purposely blocked out of my mind because they were so bad um, didn't matter ultimately. Like those customers, and this is the crazy part, were still retained better than some of the customers we get today with a 100 times better product objectively. And the reason for that is because you naturally, you know, acquire the early adopters, again, price and things were like different and lower, but the trainers were more invested in the success of the company, like all these things, right? In the early days, you somehow manage to get your best customers, even though you have your shittiest product. It just always is that way um, because you naturally acquire the people who really believe in you. Um, so yeah, it doesn't actually have to be that good from like a you're standing 10 feet away objective perspective, but when you actually use it, you do need to perceive the value. Otherwise you're wasting your time trying to grow it. Yep. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about the like, expert part of that? Yeah, uh, I mean, I guess, yeah, What are, is there anything particular about retention that you're most curious about, or? Yeah, like, I, just, I feel like that's a common problem, this, like, subscription service model, yep. it's like, you get them in the door, and it just feels like your uh, hamster are on a wheel of chasing yep. and training them in and coming out. Is there any stories or advice to that? Yeah. Um, yeah, we definitely didn't have a great understanding in the early days of how retention would end up impacting the dynamics of the business because, and this happens at a different point for every business, but it's in the early days, retention barely matters and new user acquisition matters a ton. And then there's a, a switching point somewhere in the company's trajectory where suddenly you realize that retention is actually a way bigger lever on growth than a new user acquisition is. And so for like the time when we were testing channels and stuff, I don't think we really had any great visibility into what our retention actually was. We just had a general sense of, okay, it seems pretty good. Like they're not leaving immediately. And, you know, looking back on that data now in hindsight, we, we know that the retention, especially of those early cohorts was considered best in class for consumer products, which I would say is, 50% of a monthly subscription is still renewing after 12 months, for example. That's just a random number I'm throwing out there, but most people would agree that that is really, really good for a monthly consumer business, especially one that's charging $100 a month for the product. Um, if you're retaining 20% of your customers at a year, again, a lot of huge consumer businesses have that as their number, um, but that's going to be more expensive to fund in the long run. So I would say like, if you're acquiring a customer, they're paying you once and then almost every customer is leaving. Yeah, then I would say like, okay, the product is, is not good enough. We're kind of tricking people into buying something that we're not actually delivering. Um, if, you know, 100% buy and then 70 and then 50 and then 40 and then 30 and then 30 and then 20 and then 20. And like, it kind of like, you know, is this longer curve you'd expect. That's more like normal for a consumer business. And so I would say, 
okay, there's something here. It could definitely be better, um, but I'm not going to like rule out this whole product because their attention's bad. Um, so in the early days, it's definitely a gut thing um, because you don't have the data. Um, but yeah, looking at like one month or free trial conversion is another one that's really easy to use. If you have a free trial, what percentage of people actually pay you afterwards? And for our first you know, cohort that came from those videos, I think we had about 80%, which is again, best in class. And we didn't know that at the time. We were just like, okay, cool. It's 80%, whatever, moving on. But again, looking back, we now know that that is far better than almost any like large consumer company achieves. Um, and that has dropped slightly over time. I think we're at, you know, between 65 and 70% now, but it still has stayed at a level that is really strong. So again, if that number was 10%, I would be like, yeah, this is not, <laughs> there's something's wrong here. Um, so again, gut check. Yeah. And just to quickly Go ahead. add, yeah, the proxies early on when you don't have actual retention data, then using proxies like trial conversion or engagement metrics is going to be really valuable. Mm -hmm. And then talking to the people who are using the product the most or are converting the best and try to get as much information from them and create like a profile or persona of okay, who are the types of people that seem to be using this the most, getting the most value and sticking with it with the data that you have? And that's kind of the, the best indicator of retention. And then you can focus more on acquiring more people like that um, or building the product more suited to their needs um, to make that, find, to find people that really love the product. Yeah, yeah. just talking to users. Yeah. yeah. Uh, do you guys hire any software engineer or are you just a third party copy between the application for you and the give you a third party copy using the application for you? How are you guys like maintaining that the all the what can be the cost mm -hmm. to actually build this platform? Or like because you said like at the beginning the application kind of like shaky mm -hmm. but to uh, but, but with that shaky, shaky platform, like how are you still maintaining your customers to stick along with your mm -hmm. application? Yeah. How you solve that? Yeah. So um, both myself and my co-founder Gabe um, are very technical. Like I was ECE here at CMU. He was CS at MIT. We hadn't had any experience actually building applications like we had taken all the CS courses but we hadn't learned how to build web apps and databases and servers but we had the foundation of being technical to fall back on so we we're able to learn the basics of like I literally just watched a YouTube video series from Stanford on how to make an iOS app and I followed that to make the iOS app um, and that's why it was so shitty because it was literally the first app that I ever had made and you know now our engineers kind of compete to like delete the last of my shitty code uh, which is always a great sign. That means you've hired the right people. Um, and if you're excited by that, that's also a good sign. Um, but yeah, so it was all done by ourselves. We were extremely lean in the early days. Like us hiring John was a huge leap for us to like actually bring someone on the payroll and be like, okay, like, you know, hopefully this investment is worth it. Um, and we were not paying John much at the beginning. He was like making half of his salary and just being able to live with us at the time. So it was super sketchy, super early stage stuff. Um, so yeah, we definitely didn't outsource. We would have ran out of money super fast if we had paid someone else to build the app. So I normally, it really, it sometimes depends on the exact product, but almost always I encourage people to, even if they're not technical by their education, to push yourself to see how much you can build. Um, like I just met another founder who is building a, a similar kind of idea, but for like helping athletes get into schools or something completely non-technical but he had pieced together the entire product of connecting athletes with or athlete mentors with athletes using like calendly and uh zapier and some ai generated shit and he just kind of plugged it all together and he was doing like you know several hundred thousand dollars of revenue a year and he was like, hey, Matt, like, how do I build stuff? And like, that's a much better position to be in than, okay, I have nothing. I have an idea. Let me try to like build the app or so hire someone else to build the app from ground zero. So um, yeah, just push yourself to see what you can hack together, I would say. Yep. Uh, what is your most effective preferred method of talking to your current customers? Yeah, good one. I don't know if you want to talk about Yeah, that. sure. Uh, so 
nowadays we have a ton of different ways to talk to users and get feedback from them. Um, we have a lot of customers, so, and we fortunately have our product, our service is a trainer, a coach who's actually interfacing with those clients every day. So a lot of the feedback that we get comes from those interactions that trainers have with their clients. So one, one source is trainers. Another big one is just surveys. We're constantly surveying our clients and customers, new customers, existing customers, people have been with us for a long time. But uh, the, the bread and butter of talking to users is just actually setting up conversations with them. So find random customers. If you see a customer uh, in your analytics or data that's using your product or service doing something specific, uh, you can just reach out to them and say, hey, would you want to hop on a call? Or you can offer them a t-shirt or you can offer them something. Most people are happy to talk to you and give you feedback. Uh, so we just reach out and say, hey, I'd love to hop on a quick call with you. Um, but yeah, I recommend always having that face-to-face -face time with customers, even when you're really large. It's very important to continue to do that, but you also have a bunch of other resources and analytics available to you to get get feedback. We also have like a Slack channel that we have a lot of customers in that they get beta versions of stuff and we can just talk to them like literally in our normal working environment about what they think. Um, and then one other thing I've learned with feedback is it's super important to talk to users to determine like what their problems are, what value is being delivered to them, like how satisfied are they? Try to avoid asking users what features to build or even directly asking them would you would you use this feature if we built it? They will unknowingly lie to your face every single time. Like the amount of times where we've asked a hundred users, would you like this feature? And they all say yes. And then you build it and like one of them uses it regularly is crazy, right? Because people ultimately, especially on the fly, they don't know what their behavior will be. They're just trying to do an approximation of it. So we've more and more so over time moved towards if it actually is trying to answer the question of do they like this or do they like this, just measure their actual behavior, like if possible, because asking them if they like it or not doesn't matter if it doesn't line up with their behavior. So early stage, that matters less, like you're doing less, like, do you like this or do you like this? Um, but you can still use that as a tenant when you're thinking about like product features, like don't let your users build your product, um, build the product for the problem that the user has. And that's where I definitely recommend reading the mob test because that helps you kind of frame those questions so you don't end up leading yourself down that path where you're uh, kind of just chasing something that isn't actually valuable. Yeah. Anything else? Awesome. Well, thanks, guys. Connect with us. Uh, oh, sorry. Did you have one? Yeah, so like I said, literally just had a big spreadsheet, 19 different channels, a bunch of ideas within each channel. And then I prioritize them based on, okay, which ones are going to be the easiest to do, but or shortest amount of time, least amount of money, kind of easiest, uh, but have the most potential upside. Um, but we also just tested a bunch of stuff uh, that was available to us. So yeah, rank them based on what's easy, but has decent upside. If Something's going to be really hard and only get you one customer, probably not worth um, going after early on. And the upside is like the gut check? Or is that a gut check, you said? Yeah, I mean, you probably don't have much data to go off of. So, um, yeah. Ideally, by that point, you'll have some initial customers to have some data to go off of. Um, but yeah, it is a bit of a gut check in ranking. And that's why it's good to... You don't have to just go by that ranking, um, but do try and test as many channels as you can. That's the more important piece uh, so that you're not leaving any channel, any stone unturned, basically. Yeah. And to be clear, the channel that ended up working was not a particularly high ranking one by those metrics, which is fine because John was able to go from list of ideas to finding that video in about six months from when he was hired. Yes, I think. Yeah, the initial yeah. deal was signed in like uh, two months. So it was yeah, so it was, it was on his initial list, but it wasn't like the first thing he tried, right? So the important thing is just to churn through these like super, super fast so you can actually get to the one that will click. Yeah, and, and important to do several tests at a time. You don't want to do try and do like 20 tests at a time when it's just you. Um, so three, four tests at a time uh, so that you can get 
variations and learnings from all of them at once is useful. Cool. Awesome. Well, thanks guys. Yeah. Connect with us on whatever LinkedIn probably is best. And we're happy to like meet with people one-on-one -on -one and stuff if uh, we can be helpful, but thanks for the time.